Okay. So um, I think uh, uh, we are quite uh, sure about several things. One is adenocarcinoma is not the same than squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, I remember still the times where we ask our pathologist to tell us uh, at least is this a small cell or is not a small cell. Then we learn that we should at least know if it's a, a geno or an squamous. And I think uh, uh, we typically have that information in front of us when we see a patient. And it's very important, not only because they look like different, but because they are different diseases. And we have uh, strong data suggesting that the molecular background, the initiation of our genomic aberrations, and those that are actually responsible for the progression of the disease are totally different. Unfortunately, and luckily for uh, squamous cell carcinoma tumors, patients with those tumors are very unlikely to benefit from many targeted therapy because typically most of the aberrations are uh, tumors on tumor suppressor genes as compared to uh, oncogenic uh, 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 oncogenes. Indeed, with not always having good drugs for oncogene driving, driven uh, uh, lung cancer. The good example is Keras mutant, but very often we have it, like ALK or uh, ROS or EGFR or whatever. This is not the case for tumor suppressors. It's really difficult to tackle something that is not there, <laughs> such as a tumor suppressor gene. So that is the reason very small advances had been done in terms of targeted therapy for that very disease. Indeed, very few patients are having driven alteration, driver, uh, driver alteration that are actually being exploited in the clinic therapeutically. Possibly less than 2% of the tumors do have EGFR, alcohol, ROS. Maybe some patients do have BRAF. Maybe some patients do have MET mutation. I think are the two most likely events that may happen in that arena. The other issue is about patients. Patients typically with squamous cell carcinoma do have worse health. The health status is typically worse because of comorbidities very often, particularly cardiovascular, particularly respiratory uh, comorbidities. And that makes those patients at a high risk of uh, 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 toxicity as well. And uh, this is something we should take into account at the time of treating those patients. So altogether, when the disease is having uh, more uh, difficulties, because they got more genomic aberrations, but because those genomic aberrations are not targetable, and because the patients are on worse health, typically happen is that any new treatment that is being tested is not getting as good results as in the genocarcinoma. And this is the reason the results or the advances in uh, squamous cell carcinoma had not paralleled those of adenocarcinoma patients. They are actually uh, having a worse prognosis. There are, as we said, a number of potential drugs that are being tested uh, uh, on that scenario with targeted agents. So far, very little success. Actually, the most promising ones that were FGFR amplification the rate of amplification is not that high, it's not 20%, it's about maybe 5%. And indeed, the initial data suggests that very few responses and, for sh and very short-lived responses are there. DDR2 mutations, only anecdotal case reports, but no more than that. And for all the other alterations, PA, 3K, and so on, I don't think we are quite there to say we are going to get uh, uh, major uh, uh, advantages for that. So I'm going to the real life, first line, second line. What do we do? Well, platinum-based tablets are typically what we use for most of our patients, particularly wild-type patients in the clinic. This is true for non squamous as Sanjay just said, but it's true for uh, uh, squamous as well. And the only difference is that we do not typically use PEM-based outlets in uh, 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 squamous because we know that those tumors are typically not so responsive to permethrin. We typically use here taxanes-based or gencytabine 
based or being oral being based therapies as compared to a, a, a um, squamous cell carcinoma, non squamous, where a good uh, a treatment may be sometimes uh, permitted. And the reason being because the amount of TS is higher in squamous as compared to adenus, so and that is the reason permitted said that TS inhibitor is not that effective. Second issue is about using or not using carboplatin. In Europe, we tend to use cisplatin very often as compared to. Uh, carboplatin. I don't think we have so strong data to, not to use carboplatin in squamous cell carcinoma as compared to adenos. And these meta-analyses do not suggest such a benefit as in adeno. So, you know, because also those patients are very often having worse uh, 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 cardiac functioning and worse respiratory functioning, sometimes I avoid to give uh, a huge hydration with uh, cisplatin and so on. And carboplatin, I think, is a good alternative here. I quite like uh, maintenance therapy with continuation maintenance in adenocarcinomas. We are not doing that typically in, a, in a squamous. The reason being there is no data suggesting any uh, continuation maintenance is worthy in this very setting on a squamous. So we do not typically do it. In terms of recent advances, I would somehow uh, uh, spot two in the terms of squamous cell carcinoma. One would be the adding of uh, the added value of nesitumumab in the context of uh, platinum-based chemo. This is the Squire trial. You remember nearly 1,100 patients randomizing chemo, cisgem plus or less a uh, nesitumumab, an anti-AFR inhibitor, the drug being very similar to cetuzumab, I would say, and uh, the results are here, as you know. Hazard ratio being 0.84, so a clear benefit, the magnitude of the benefit not being overwhelming, and I think this is something that we should balance, taking into account toxicity, which somehow is there, not only rice, hypomagnesemia, Etc. So we should balance to which patients should we offer and at which cost in that case. Indeed, in this very trial, about 5% of the patients did have no expression at all of EFR. So when the expression of EFR was a kind of a question in terms of benefit for those patients, we didn't see that the immunochemistry score was at all predictive of benefit from this drug, but in a subset analysis, it's been shown that those patients that are positive, calling positive any positivity, 1% of the cells or more, the hazard ratio is a bit better than in the overall population, 0.79 as compared to 0.84, but you have to realize that this is because we are taking out the 5% of the tumors, more or less uh, 100 patients out of 1,100 that were negatives. On those patients that are negative, there were no advantage, but it's called only 50 patients in each treatment arm. So possibly the data are not very robust, but the truth is that the EMA only approved the drug for this very context. I don't know if it's the right decision. I'm not sure that uh, we will do it in, a, uh, uh, in our pathology lab, the EGFR determination by chemistry to really prescribe this drug. Indeed, you remember the times in colorectal cancer where cetuzumab was approved, was approved under the, uh, uh, the immunostochemistry expression being positive for those colorectal cancer, and I don't think we have done it ever at all. So that's something. Truly, uh, uh, the data of fish on this very setting is, I would say, at least interesting. The data suggests that the predictive value is maybe better, of course. This is based on a small subset of analysis. But there are some data from other trials suggesting that maybe there is a role for fish in this setting to better predict the benefit from EFR monoclonal antibodies, and I think we should do some, uh, pursue some studies with those type of agents in this context. Also important is that the benefit here is not for every single patient. 
There were no clear differences when you look at the forest plot, but this suggests that those patients that are older than uh, 70 are not getting a clear benefit. I understand this is just a secondary analysis, but this is the population that is also getting more toxicity probably, and the toxicity here is sometimes relevant. So that is the typical population. Possibly I will not offer in uh, uh, every day to my patients in the clinic to have a triplate with this drug as compared to a platinum tablet, at least. Another drug that has been incorporated in some countries to the use of squamous cell carcinoma is uh, Abraxane, Napaclitaxel, in chemo tablets, platinum plus Abraxane. The truth is that the <coughs> they are not very robust, maybe some increase in response rate, no clear advantage in PFS or OS, maybe better uh, tox profile as compared to Paclitaxel, but uh, of course this is an alternative we should take into account uh, uh, and use this uh, uh, depending on the context you're working. <coughs> Possibly the more important result in this very setting is being already shown is concerning the first line setting on patients with tumor that express uh, 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 PDL1 in more than 50% of the cells. So the highly positive tumors for PDL expression, those patients are maybe doing better on Pembro as compared to chemo, as been shown uh, by Dr. Popat just a minute, some minutes ago. In this very trial, only about 20% of the patients were, or 30% were, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, but of course the benefit was actually even better for squamous as compared to non-squamous. Possibly the reason was because the control arm did better on non-squamous as compared to squamous. That is the reason. But still, I would say <clears throat> a hazard ratio for PFS of 0.35 is really magnificent. And I think this is something we should take into account into the future when we have the possibility of prescribing such a treatment for those patients. So it's a pretty non-toxic drug and uh, good uh, results. Less clear for me is the potential in the future of combos, chemo plus uh, Pembro or uh, any other anti pd one agents. We will have the result of uh, uh, the Empower trial with a TISO in combination or not with chemo plus Viva uh, or not, and I think that would be very important data. At the present time, I'm not fully convinced that we should give everything all together as compared to sequentially. We have seen uh, that there are some toxicity concerns because of that, and I'm not uh, totally convinced yet about the advantage. <clears throat> In the second line setting, the data uh, should be referred to the standard of care. The standard of care was still very recently only uh, tax tier then Erlarinib was added. The value of Erlarinib based on the BR21 on squamous is still more debatable as compared to non-squamous, which is uh, controversial enough. Still, we got some additional data based on Afarinib. There was this phase three trial comparing Erlarinib to Afarinib in pre-treated patients, having some advantage for Afarinib. The question nowadays is how much uh, uh, a good comparator is a lot in this setting. So my taking here is that possibly a fat in it is not having a huge role. If at all, I would consider it only for patients that really want some treatment later on, maybe third or four line uh, for very few patients. Importantly, some of the very relevant issues also in the squamous had been also commented for on the squamous, which is the, the, the demonstration that uh, antiurianics got a role in the second line setting. Actually, this is true for the squamous as well. You remember that BIVA trials were never performing the first line setting in squamous because of the risk of bleeding. Here, it's been shown that ramesurumab is safe at least as safe as in non squamous in uh, the second line setting in combination with uh, tax tier. And the good news is that also improved somehow survival, modestly, of course, in that very setting. And as you see here, has a ratio being about 0 0.85, an increase in survival of about uh, two months or a bit less. 
In this uh, setting, Nintendo Nib is also being shown to improve survival, but that only in uh, non squamous histology. So if you're going to use chemo plus an antiagenic in this setting, Ramo should be the one. And of course, there are some uh, uh, very short data as well with Bivacizumab, but I would say phase three data mainly done or restricted to Ramo. The final word would be for PD-1 inhibitors, PDL. PD-1 and PD-1 inhibitors in this setting. We got data suggesting that about 20% of the patients respond if they have not been exposed, of course, to first-line immunotherapy. That response, of course, is more likely to happen. You have a positive pd one expression in the tumor as compared if you are negative. Maybe 25%, 30% response if you are positive. Maybe 5 to 10% if you are pd one negative. And we have enough data nowadays to say this is a good treatment for the second line safety. And it's true for non squamous and it's true for squamous. It's improving results as compared to, to chemotherapy, to taxotere. This has been shown for squamous specifically on the 17 trial, checkmate 17 trial. And the data is actually at least as good as compared to those achieved in non squamous. Actually, we were referring before about the data. Uh, 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 on long-term uh, uh, data, and the curve seems to me maybe a bit more tending to the plateau in the case of squamous, not only in that case, but also with Pembro and so on, but still I think we are uh, 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 with not enough maturity to say we are going to get a number of long-term survivors after five years or whatever. But the good uh, news is that at least we are kind of doubling the number of patients that are alive at two years as compared to what we are getting with the standard of care. Now we got data on some other uh, compounds, a tissue and a, a, a pembro showing more or less the same results, showing the, uh, that the benefit in the second and third line setting is there for those agents, the same type of magnitude of the benefit and indeed those data also suggest that there is no clear difference between histology. So the same ratio of benefit you're getting for non squamous as compared to squamous. So I typically tend to give for my patients in the second line setting, if they didn't receive before that, I typically treat a squamous patient with immunotherapy, with anti PD1 agents. The question is about how important is pdl one expression in squamous patients. The data are somehow scarce in this setting. Because of the O17 trial, which is a very small trial, only about uh, 100 and 250 patients, that means 130 patients per arm, which means 65 patients being positive, 55, 65 being negative in the treatment arm and in the control arm. So it's a very unrobust comparison to say it's enough to say you're negative, you're going to benefit. So for the time being, the drug is approved in this setting. So if my patient is very fit for chemotherapy, I may do chemotherapy first if the tumor is PDR1 negative. If the tumor is PDR1 positive, I tend to do first immunotherapy. If the patient is not fit for chemo, I still may use it because it's approved and the patient is a candidate and because I'm not that sure as in non squamous to say the drug is not benefiting the patient. So just to finalize my conclusions, I think that uh, first of all we have to realize this is a very difficult disease with unhealthy patients and it's still a an, uh, clear and met clinical need to improve the results in that very setting. For first line immunotherapy PD-1 inhibitors are making their, uh, 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 I mean, are getting there, and I think they are getting there to stay. We are not able to prescribe it yet, but I think this is going to be part of our treatment strategy in the very near future. For those patients that are considered uh, to chemotherapy nowadays, which are most of them in standard of care, we should take into account potentially a triplet, particularly for healthy, fit patients. And Abraxane is still also another possibility there to be used in doublets. For patients in the second line setting, if they didn't receive 
immunotherapy before, maybe PD-1 agents are a good alternative. If the patient is negative on PDR1 expression in tumor, maybe chemo plus Ramo would be a, a, a potential alternative if the patient is really fit at this very stage. Thirdly, afatinib maybe have some residual role as third line uh, uh, therapy for some potential basis. Thank you. The, just the last question, uh, the last uh, issue I'd like to, 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 to raise here is that because the disease, which is really a difficult one, difficult to treat, because palliation is not that effective in this setting, and because the patients, they got a lot of comorbidity, I think palliative care is particularly relevant in this setting. I just remember you, the Tamil trial, showing, I would say, or at least my reading on this trial is that you are treating your patient with the best therapy and you're giving the best patient care. Your patient <coughs> is having better palliation, is living longer and is living better. And I think this is particularly important for our squamous carcinoma patient. Sorry, now is that I'm done. Thank you.